Hello, Internet, and thanks for tuning in to Fringineering Labs. Over the past couple weeks, I've been playing with etching my own circuit boards at home. It's such a simple process that it amazes me whenever I meet someone who is into circuit design who hasn't done this before. If you want a prototype, people will just order it from a company that does prototype runs of circuit boards and it um, costs a huge amount of money for what you're getting. If it's something that's not critical and it's just a little more complicated than something you would do just on some perf board, this is an inexpensive way to turn out your own circuit boards at home. These are all circuit boards that I made uh, almost entirely from scratch. I actually made the material that they're made from, this uh, copper clad composite, out of layers of fiberglass that I epoxy together. But you can buy copper clad composite just about anywhere that sells hobby electronic stuff. I thought I would take this opportunity to explain the process of etching your own circuit boards at home. Let's do it. So, what are you going to need? Well, the process can be split up into two stages, really. The first stage is preparing your board to be etched. And then the second stage is actually etching the board. So, for the preparation stage, you're just going to need a few things. A Scotch-Brite pad that you're never going to use to wash dishes again. Some toner transfer paper. A roll of paper towel is a nice thing to have. An iron to actually do the toner transfer to mask your board off. A surface that's flat and flame-resistant that uh, you can... Um, iron on. You'll probably want a bottle of isopropyl alcohol just as a general solvent. Isopropyl alcohol is by far my favorite uh, workshop solvent because it's relatively harmless and um, there are very few things that between water and alcohol you can't dissolve. A general purpose hobby knife, a Zacto knife, works fine. And also a um, small sharpie marker, a fine tip sharpie. Now, in the actual etching stage, we're going to be working with a chemical called ferric chloride, which is a salt of iron that is incredibly corrosive to copper and to some other metals. Obviously, it won't touch things like glass and plastic. It is mildly toxic and it is uh, corrosive, so you don't want to get it on your hands. Aside from that, and really the worst part about it, is that it stains like the Dickens. It, it's a dark brown liquid and it'll turn just about anything yellow. So, um, one thing you definitely want to have on hand is some gloves. Um, I use latex gloves because I don't have a problem with latex. Some people, you might want to get a vinyl glove. Besides the gloves, you're going to want some ferric chloride itself. This is a jug of ferric chloride. Um, I bought this as um, the anhydrous uh, salt in uh, powder form, and you just mix it with water. And uh, that does generate a little bit of gas that you don't really want to breathe, so you might want to mix it outside. Um, after it's mixed, it's fairly stable stuff, and you're not going to have a big deal. Um, I mean, you're not going to have problems using it inside, but you do want to work on a surface. I've got a nice glass surface here to work on. So if I spill a little bit of it, it won't stain anything, and I can get it up um, before it does any damage. You'll also want some tray, some nice uh, flat and not all that deep container that you can actually etch the boards in. I have this Pyrex dish and I just bought this at Walmart and that is uh, really the perfect container. After I'm done with it um, I can pour the chloride back into the um, bottle and then put the lid on here and uh, it's all sealed up. I don't have to worry about it smelling. Um, and for the record, it, uh, ferric chloride doesn't have a strong smell, but it does have a nasty smell, and you probably don't really want to breathe it. In here, you can probably see I've got some plastic tools, some plastic palette knives that I bought um, at a hobby shop. So those work great for um, <clears throat> actually manipulating the board when it's under the ferric chloride. So you might want to get those, or glass stir rod, or anything made out of glass or plastic that uh, won't absorb the ferric chloride or get eaten away by it. Definitely don't use a metal container to do your etching in, and don't use metal implements when you're etching. So um, <clears throat> that's pretty much everything that you'll need to do the actual etching. And you can see, actually, uh, just from uh, touching that bottle of ferric chloride, there was some on the outside, and it's already staining my gloves sort of a yellow, brownish-yellow color. <clears throat> and it'll stain, I mean, it'll stain porcelain. It'll stain, uh, it would stain glass if you gave it a minute, so... Um, you do want to be careful with that. 
Okay, well, um, let's get into preparing the board. So this is the board itself that we're gonna be working with. I bought this at Radio Shack. I think it cost me five bucks or something. You can get it in all sorts of sizes, thicknesses, different core materials, but uh, the most common one that you're gonna find is something called FR4, which is just a fiberglass, a woven fiberglass, um, that's laminated together with a flame retardant epoxy resin. And this comes in a couple standard thicknesses. The copper comes in different thicknesses. I think this is a one ounce copper, which means there's one ounce of copper per square foot. This is a two-sided. You can get it in uh, one-sided if, you if you're doing a one-sided circuit. You can see the fiberglass on one side and then copper on the other. This is a two-sided board because that's what they had um, when I went to the store. I made some, some of this myself um, out of fiberglass. Um, you can certainly do that, but if you just want to get a circuit out the door, um, I suggest going and buying some. So when you get this, uh, there will be a little bit of film sort of on the copper. This is where the Scotch-Brite pad comes in. Take this to a uh, sink and take your Scotch-Brite pad and just sort of abrade that copper a little bit. And uh, that'll get through that layer and expose some fresh copper. And after you've hit it with the Scotch-Brite pad, get out your isopropyl alcohol and your paper towels and just take some alcohol and uh, wipe off the board so that it's nice and clean and gets any oils and any oxides off there that are going to affect uh, the etch. I'm gonna do that and then I'll come back and we'll do the next step. All right, that's probably good enough. Let's prepare the mask. So, the purpose of a mask when you're etching uh, circuit board is to prevent your etchant, in this case ferric chloride, from eating away the copper that you want to leave on the board. There are actually a few ways to do this. The traditional way is to coat the board with a chemical that hardens when it's exposed to light, uh, much the same way as you would uh, do a screen for screen printing. And then uh, you print your circuit on a transparency, lay the transparency over your board and expose it to light over the course of uh, 15 minutes, half an hour, however long that chemical is rated for, and the hardened parts stick to the board and the rest of it you rinse off and then that leaves a mask that you can etch around. There is uh, another popular method by uh, which you can spray the board with a flat black spray paint, allow that to dry, and then actually put the whole board into a laser cutter and use the laser cutter to etch away the parts of the mask uh, that you want to get rid of. A really popular way of doing it at home is to use a paper like this or just a glossy magazine paper to actually print the design for the circuit board on a laser printer. So an inkjet printer won't work because you need the laser toner which is a uh, plasticky material that will actually melt um, onto the surface of your board. So um, this paper I bought on eBay, and this is a special paper designed for this purpose, and what it appears to me to be is just some acetate, um, like you would use for making a transparency um, for an overhead projector, coated with uh, some kind of material that acts as a release agent for the toner and keeps it from sticking to the acetate. So uh, you just print your design mirror image on the dull side of this paper and then you put that face down onto your board and iron it. And what that does is it heats up the toner um, the same way that it happens in the laser printer itself um, except you're, because there's a release agent on this paper and that's either this blue stuff or if you're using glossy magazine paper, it's the gloss on top of the paper. That release agent allows the uh, melted toner to stick down to the copper surface instead of to the papers. Uh, like I said, ferric chloride really likes to eat copper because copper is uh, really reactive, but um, there's not a whole lot else that it, that it will eat. So. Um, just about anything will act as a mask. And actually, you'll see when I talk about touch-up, uh, we'll use a, a Sharpie marker as a mask. So I've actually printed some circuits onto this transfer paper. Um, first, just cut out those um, transfers, and um, it cuts just like a transparency paper would cut. So a pair of scissors, which wasn't uh, I didn't give you on the list of materials, but you should be able to find a pair of scissors. 
And you don't have to cut it too close to the edges. It doesn't matter how big this thing is, only the ink will transfer. So um, if you're doing a two-sided board, you probably want to cut them roughly the size of the board so that um, when you uh, laminate it all together, you can line things up properly. So now that I've cut those loose, I can see kind of what the size of my board is going to be. As you can see, I don't need the entire piece of copper clad. Um, so we're going to have to trim it down the size. And the way that you do that <clears throat> is to simply score it with a box cutter. And in the absence of a box cutter, I actually have my hobby knife. Score it with the hobby knife uh, across the length and then uh, turn it over, score it on the other side and then put it on a, on a uh, hard edge and just snap it off. Um, somewhat similar to the, to the process of breaking a piece of glass. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and do that. You can actually take a pair of scissors and trim along the edge there. It's pretty soft stuff, so uh, <clears throat> cutting it with scissors isn't a problem. It is fiberglass though, so if you're uh, drilling it or sanding it or doing anything that'll get um, fiberglass into the air, um, you probably want to wear a dust mask. So now that we have our board that's about the same size as our circuit, you can put that over top there and see that it fits and uh, get our ironing surface out. I'm using a piece of a bamboo cutting board that I uh, ruined by neglecting to oil it. <clears throat> and, um, and you're just going to lay that on your ironing surface. Get out your iron, your clothes iron, and um, set that. For this paper, you want to set it to a high temperature probably just below where you would start to melt the acetate. So on my iron, that is a setting right between uh, nylon, which is the lowest setting, and wools. So not quite hot enough to iron wool, but uh, um, acetate can handle a little more heat than, uh, than nylon can. So um, probably a setting between, between low and medium on your iron. I'll plug this in and uh, warm it up and then we'll start the transfer. All right, I think our iron's heated up to the proper temperature. So what we're going to do is take a look at the board and make sure that your circuit is lined up the way that you want it to be on the board. In this case, it's not all that critical, but uh, if you're doing a two-sided board, you definitely want to pay attention to that. Lay that on your ironing surface and then uh, hold one side of the board down and take your iron and with just a little bit of pressure, go ahead and iron that onto the board. See, up top there is where I've hit it with the iron, and you can see the traces showing through, and on the other side, um, that hasn't happened yet, so I haven't melted the toner down yet. Eventually, this board's going to get too hot to hold down as you iron it. <clears throat> I usually just take a piece of paper towel and fold it up into a little pad that I can kind of hold the board down. And you do want to put a little bit of pressure uh, with your with your hand on the board to make sure that the um, transfer paper doesn't slip around while you're ironing. It won't have a tendency to do that if you're using this uh, blue paper because it does melt down to the surface pretty well and the back of it is a nice slippery plastic that the iron won't get a grip on and try to tear the paper away. But if you're using um, glossy magazine paper then you may have a problem with the iron sticking to the toner on the iron side of the paper and uh, like the original toner that was used to print the magazine and uh, that could turn into a problem where the iron tries to pull the transfer paper away from the copper. Just try to split it up visually into zones and hit each zone um, with a good amount of heat and, and pressure and then sit the iron on top of your board and just push down and you want to be pushing straight down. If you push at an angle, uh, you could release all of the toner, get it all into sort of a plastic state and then slide um, the transfer paper across the copper 
and that th that's basically game over. You need to go and remove that uh, ruined mask from the copper and try again. So um, you want to avoid that situation. You may even notice that the that the the toner has transferred and the paper is starting to peel up on one side. That's totally okay, um, as long as the um, ink isn't coming up with the paper, then you know you've done um, a good job heating this up. So um, I think I've probably got it to the point where it's good now. The directions for this paper tell you to quench it with water after you've done that, um, basically to prevent that, that toner from coming up and sticking to the plastic again. I find that that's not really necessary um, if you have nice wide traces on your board. If you're doing something with really fine trace widths, you might want to um, heed that advice, but uh, as long as you can pick up the board, um, I'm going to hold it up to the camera and peel away. And what you should see, yep, is you can now see through the parts of the paper that used to have toner on them. And the toner is now on the board itself. Uh, if you're doing a two sided board, um, you can get another, you can get the other side of your board and uh, lay this face down on your ironing surface and go ahead and do the other side. Um, if you're careful about it, you won't transfer this mask off of this side as you heat this side up. So um, that depends on your ironing surface. Um, I recommend a nice flat hard surface instead of something like a towel or an ironing board that you would traditionally use. And that also allows you to get a little bit more pressure uh, behind the iron. Today, I'm just gonna do a one-sided board um, in the interest of time and simplicity. So now that we have this board and uh, you can see that the mask is on there, um, when we dip this in the ferric chloride, it will eat all of this exposed copper and leave everything under the ink alone. You can see that there are splotchy parts of this mask that the etchant will actually get into and eat away the copper there. So uh, what we need is we need to apply a mask in that section. And in this case, your fine tip Sharpie marker is going to act as your etch mask. Pop the top off that marker and uh, go in, and I'm just gonna kind of go in and quickly try to find the, uh, the bigger holes here that really need um, to be filled in. So there it is after a little bit of touch up. You can see it looks a little bit more solid. Um, you want to let the Sharpie dry uh, for a good couple minutes before you go to the etch. Um, if you pop this directly into the etch bath before all the solvent from the Sharpie has evaporated off, um, the Sharpie will sort of slosh around and get washed away um, just by the virtue of the etchant being a fluid. So um, you do want to be careful of that. Just make sure it has a little bit of dry time. Let's unplug this iron and get it out of the way. So one thing that you're probably wondering is, well, if I can use the um, Sharpie as an etch mask, then why don't I just draw the circuit by hand? That's totally cool. If you can draw a circuit by hand, if it's just a really simple, like a breakout board or something, you could probably do that. And it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, as a matter of fact, since I have a two-sided board and I only have a circuit on one side, I'm going to go ahead and on the back, I'm just going to sign it. I'll do a little, uh, I'll do a little fringineering logo here. All right, fringineering. Dot com. Ah, there you go. That's not very pretty, but we'll see if that uh, we'll see if that masks, and if we can get that etched into the board there. When I work with ferric chloride, I take the lid off of my etch tray. And I flip it over and I lay all my implements on that lid and that way I don't get uh, etchant over all my, on all my stuff. Another thing that I do is I do all of my pouring over a large um, Rubbermaid container that I keep all of my etching stuff in. And that way uh, if I spill a little bit or if there's chloride on the outside of stuff, I only go in that box if I have gloves on. So all of the mess is basically contained to that box. And I'll probably get a few drips here and there on my, uh, on my desk, but um, you know, that'll come off with a little paper towel action. So I'm not too worried about that. All right, so I've got my little spatula implement and I've got my bath of etchant. And uh, it really is just as simple as taking your board and um, 
Just dipping it down into that etchant and use, uh, so as you can see, I, I'm sort of like stirring it a little bit. You can see it's a little bit viscous. So um, the board may not want to sink uh, immediately. So just push it down to the bottom of the tank there and um, move it around a little bit. And actually, you need to agitate this tank of etching. So if you don't agitate the tank, what happens is um, a film of oxide forms on the top of the board and it actually prevents more etching from happening. So one way to do that is to just take uh, your implement and uh, just sort of swish it around and stir the mixture and uh, just don't let the board stop moving. You can even sort of scrape the top of the board with your spatula. Professional etch tanks actually have agitators in them. Some of them are bubble agitators, much like the oxygenating um, pumps on a fish tank. And some of them are mechanical agitators, like a washing machine. And actually, um, my favorite way to do this at home is to get a, how about a pencil? Take a pencil, put that on your, uh, on your work surface here. See, I've already got, I've already got the stuff on my desk and sit that on top of the pencil. And this works if your tray is a little bit uh, wider than mine. Mine, this is actually, pencil's a little too high profile, but um, then you can rock it back and forth across the pencil and create a little wave that will uh, move the oxide away from the board. You can automate this process, obviously. This would be an excellent place to use something like a servo or a continuous rotation motor with, a, with a, an arm on it that can push the tray down at one end and just put a weight at the other end and it would just do this continuously. Maybe I'll do that. Maybe that'll be one of the projects we do is um, a homemade etch tank. So this process works fairly well for small stuff, but if I get into bigger boards, I'm gonna need something. If you can see that, the copper is a real light color up here. You can tell that it's starting to actually get through. Um, and around the edges, you can actually see most of the copper is missing around the edge. Um, so we are getting through. And on the back side, where uh, it's all Sharpie, you can see a large portion of the copper is already gone. Um, as the copper etches away, it'll turn sort of a pink color. And then it'll just sort of disappear. There are other solutions that work for etching copper. My favorite less toxic solution to etching boards is probably, uh, just because it's so clever, is vinegar, uh, hydrogen peroxide, and salt. And um, you can use the dilute peroxide that you buy at a drugstore, and you mix it with vinegar and salt. And um, it's kind of a one-two punch where the um, hydroxide is your strong oxidizer and it oxidizes the copper. The vinegar works uh, to actually remove that oxide and the salt um, acts, I, I suspect, as just um, a bit of an abrasive um, to, re to help remove that oxide. And I have done that. It smells terrible, um, as you can imagine. The neither um, hydrogen peroxide or vinegar smell great. So um, combined, it's kind of hellish, but um, it smells worse, but it's, it's, not as, uh, it's not as toxic. And you can put that down the drain after you're done with it. This, you can't put down the drain. Um, and actually, the problem isn't that it's a nasty, corrosive uh, chemical. The problem is that after you've used it, it's full of copper. And uh, that copper can be damaging to the environment. Not to mention that uh, because it is a chemical that's so adept at etching copper, um, there is still a lot of copper plumbing out there that uh, you could potentially damage this way. So, all right, so it's been about 15, about 15 minutes maybe, and uh, go ahead and pull our board out of the solution here. All of the copper that was on this board is now in solution down there. And so now, I'm going to take this and I'm going to rinse it off in the sink and um, then we're going to remove the mask and expose the copper. I eat off this desk.
A cool trick for removing gloves, um, the best way to do that is to pinch towards the bottom of your glove with one, with one hand, and then while that hand is still gloved, grab the cuff of the other glove and pull this one off. And then pull this one off all the way, and now when you go to grab this glove, you're grabbing the inside of the glove and not the outside. And then you can hold both of them there, only holding the inside of the gloves and not getting anything on your hands. So I've taken our freshly etched board and rinsed it off with a little uh, warm water and hit it with a little bit of dish soap just to get rid of any sediment or um, leftover etchant that might be stuck to the board. And you can see that the mask is still there. There's a little bit of exposed copper from where I got some of the mask came off while I was rinsing it. Um, so it's pretty much done at this point, and we just need to remove that mask from the copper so we can solder to it. Uh, the method that I see sort of um, encouraged the most is to use nail polish remover. This is uh, usually acetone. Acetone works really well for this sort of thing, but uh, the more that I... The more I use acetone, the more I realize that it's really, it's really better just to use a little bit of light abrasion. The acetone is fine, but unless you have a really thin copper layer and you're afraid of etching, of um, scrubbing through it, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't bother really. So we'll put that aside and we'll get out the Scotch-Brite pad. And you just want to take your Scotch-Brite pad and uh, I'll see if I can, you know, just sort of lightly... You know, maybe do circles and um, do this under running water and it'll remove that mask and leave the copper intact. So I'm going to go do that and bring it back and show you what that looks like. All right, well, I hit it with the Scotch-Brite pad and you can see I removed all the mask. All that's left is copper. And uh, that's pretty much the end of the process. I do have some vias in here for through-hole parts and... Uh, I'll need to drill those out using a small drill bit and a drill press or a Dremel tool and some, some tiny little drill bits. And if you actually want to do a plated through hole, um, then you're going to have to install through hole grommets, which is a little piece of hardware that goes in much like a grommet uh, that would be used on a boot for a, for a boot lace or on your clothes. Um, it's just smaller and you just... Uh, press it into place and it creates a conductive through hole for your parts. So there it is, homemade PCB. You can do this yourself. This took, uh, you know, all of 20, 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, and whereas the turnaround time for something like this from a, a PCB fab house would be a couple weeks. So uh, this is one of those things that'll get you from uh, an idea to a physical object really quickly. Uh, if you're just doing a few of them. So it's a cool thing to know how to do. You know, thanks for joining me today on Fringineering Labs, and uh, hopefully you can give this a shot. All in all, it didn't cost all that much, and uh, it's a fun project. So get out there and do it. Happy hacking.